In the name of the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And so let's have some fun this morning and uh, recall some kind of basic beliefs of our faith and why that is, and then apply it to the readings. So one of the things is to kind of understand this notion of inspiration and what it means to say that scripture is inspired. And what we mean by that is that the Holy Spirit intended it and for a purpose, but there are a lot of claims out there among different Christian groups about what that is. And so, for example, the Christian fundamentalists tend to claim that to say that scripture is inspired is dictated, that it's inspiration equals dictation. Now, there are parts of the Bible, in truth, where it looks pretty clear, and I'm thinking of some of the Old Testament prophets, where they heard a specific message from God, and then they were called to deliver that message. And there is a component of dictation-like element. But because one part of scripture has a, a capacity to look like dictation doesn't mean that it's all dictated. And in the Episcopal Church, we believe that uh, inspiration is not dictation most of the time. Most of the time, it's closer to kind of artistic achievement, like artists that get uh, an inspiration and an idea and they kind of work it through. And part of the reason we believe this is that you can see editing actually going on in the New Testament if you look closely at the Gospels. And indeed, I think St. Paul would have probably used different language uh, in many different ways if he thought that his letters were inspiration. They were certainly rhetoric. They were pastoral. They were, they were impassioned. And we read this beautiful letter from John to his community. But, for example, if Paul had believed he could have gotten more authority by saying, this is inspiration, I think he would have done it. And also negatively, Paul said some things that I think if he thought the church later would, would have called this inspiration and made it Holy Scripture, I think I'm pretty confident he would have changed some of the stuff he said. What comes to mind is when Paul is famously so angry at, some, at one of the members of his community that he literally says in one of his letters, I wish you would just castrate yourself. Well, you know, I think he might have probably been a little more delicate if he thought that we were going to find this as inspiration. But indeed, inspiration comes from many sources and means many things, and it doesn't mean we got to take everything literally, which is why we as Episcopalians and Anglicans believe we've got to look at scripture, tradition, and reason together. And so I had a very interesting experience this week that has led to the inspiration of this sermon, which is, I don't know if you've, if you've heard of or ever read anything by Jonathan Edwards. Now, Jonathan Edwards has been called perhaps the greatest American theologian that we have yet to produce, which is quite a claim. He's undoubtedly brilliant, and he's very famous for a very specific sermon that he preached, uh, and it's called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And he preached this, uh, he was a New Englander, and he preached this, I'm gonna get the exact date here, he preached this in 1741. Now, I had never read this before because I'm not a big kind of wrath guy, but Lori and Lily gave me this uh, collection of essays, The Glorious American Essay, and it's number two. And I read this this week. And I want to read this to you because this is what uh, Reverend uh, Edwards would say to us. And when he says the word here, I want you to imagine he's talking to us here on Zoom. So here's how he ends this long sermon. Are there not many here, here in Zoom, who have lived long in the world and are not to this day born again still, and are aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and have done nothing ever since they have lived but treasure up wrath against the day of wrath? Oh, sirs, your case, and in a special manner, is extremely dangerous. Your guilt and hardness of heart is extremely great. Do you not see how generally persons of your years are passed over and left in the present and remarkable, wonderful dispensation of God's mercy? Had you need to consider yourselves and awake th thoroughly out of sleep, you cannot bear the fierceness and wrath of the infinite God. And you, 
young men and young women, will you neglect this precious season which you now enjoy when so many others of your age are renouncing all youthful vanities and flocking to Christ? You especially have now an extraordinary opportunity, but if you neglect it, it will soon be with you as with those persons who spent all the precious days of youth in sin and are now come to a dreadful pass in blindness and hardness. Oh, and you children, are you unconverted? Do you not know that you are going down to hell to bear the dreadful wrath of that God who is now angry with you every day and every night? Will you be content to be the children of the devil when so many other children in the land are converted and are become the holy and happy children of the King of Kings? And let everyone that is yet of Christ and hanging over the pit of hell, whether they be old men and women or middle-aged or young people or little children, now hearken to the loud calls of God's word and providence. Mm -hmm. So it is in the context of reading this famous sermon for the first time that I got to tell you, my jaw was like on the ground. Now you've got a better sense, for example, of why in American Christianity, there became a move, him writing this in the 18th century and then the 19th century, a move away from this to other things. Let me put it differently. If there was ever, well, let, let's say this about the wrath of God. There are passages in the Old Testament and the New Testament where we hear talk about God's wrath. But we have to understand that scripture is a witness and an evolving witness to who God is and God's nature and what it's like to be in relationship with God and with one another. And there are indeed unarguable, because you can find them in scripture, points where along that journey from Abraham all the way forward, Noah all the way forward, we get notions periodically of God's wrath. But we also get other notions, and those notions develop over time. That is what scripture is. It's the witness to the unfolding of the faith of who we are, of who God is, of what life is all about. So let me say it differently. If there was ever a moment for God's wrath, it is this moment that we hear about in Scripture today. Think of it this way. Jesus last week was on the road to Emmaus, and you heard about that. And now in today's story in Luke, he's finally appearing to the disciples. And if there's ever a moment for God's wrath, it is now. He would have said something like this. I have taught y'all for quite a long time and you all abandoned me and scattered. Peter, you are the rock on which I am to build my church. I told you, you would deny me three times before the cock crows twice. I foretold you, and you still did it. And you, of my Jewish nation and brothers and sisters, you betrayed me. You set up a false trial. You whipped me. You tortured me. And you crucified me. And if there is ever a righteous moment for God to show wrath, it is right here and right now. Jesus, in his righteousness of all he has gone through, it is a place where if his nature is wrath, if the very nature of God is wrath, it is perfect for right now. And what do we find instead? No wrath. 
the first words of, of Jesus are the exact opposite. Peace be with you. What does he say at the end of this? You are to go forth and to declare all nations my forgiveness. That Jesus comes back and he's with them and he's trying to tell them, I'm real, I'm not a ghost. Put your hands and feet when he still doesn't get it. He says, hey, you got some fish? I want to hang out. I'm not here to bring wrath. I'm here to bring peace. I'm here to bring forgiveness. I'm here to bring love. I'm here to bring mercy. And you are to do the same likewise. In fact, you're to go to all the world and profess the forgiveness and love of God. And so in the second reading from 1 Peter, Peter in the early church picks up on this, as do all the scriptures. And Peter says, this is why we talk about, and I use the word beloved, we just had it in scripture. We are the children of God. He uses the word beloved. And he says something that is absolutely mind-blowing, and we need to understand how he means it. He says, when we see him finally, we are going to be like him. And he doesn't mean that as a simile, losing like or as. You know, uh, Shakespeare famously used similes to describe people and autumn and seasons and trees and other poets do it all the time. This is not what John is saying. What John is saying is when we are with him and we are there and we have been perfected and sanctified completely, we are going to be like Jesus, which means what? Our humanity will be cleansed and perfected and we'll be one with God as he is one with God. And we will enjoy the bliss and nature and eternity of the Trinity forever. There has never been a greater proclamation of human purpose and human nature by any philosophy or religion than that. Our goal as beloved children is to be one with the Trinity in joy and felicity forever. Not wrath, not alienation, not guilt, not telling children God hates them. I would say to our brother, my brother Jonathan, <laughs> you're brilliant, far smarter than me, but brother, you got to go back to 1 John and better yet, go back to Luke, to the moment where if God's nature were truly wrathful, the perfect moment when it would be expressed. And instead, we see the nature of God in Christ revealed. Thanks. Thanks be to God. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.